Well, good morning, Venture. I want to extend as well with uh, Chuck and Alicia just my thanks to uh, all of you. Uh, I want to thank you especially. If we can go ahead and turn the lights up, I'd like to see them when I thank them actually here. So uh, I want to uh, thank all of you just for serving last weekend. Um, throughout the weekend, we, we had so many volunteers who stepped forward. I saw you in the parking lots. You were out. You were greeting at doors. We had people working in our Venture Kids, all different places, all weekend long. And it's a holiday weekend, so I know what that cost you as a volunteer, but I also know why you did it. And the opportunity for us to share the gospel, to link arms, to partner together, there's few things that are more rewarding but I, 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 we would be remiss if we just didn't stop for a moment and say thank you again. Every time we ask Venture to step up, you guys step up and you serve with us. In fact, I really wanna encourage you, maybe you weren't able to serve last weekend or you did, uh, one of our best ways that we love, if you wanna be a part of Venture, we love serving our community. Um, when we have these serve days, when we've had beautiful day and serve days, it's one of my favorite things we do as a church because we go out into the Bay Area and we serve different places. And we've got that coming this weekend. Uh, this coming weekend, we're gonna go serve at the Boys and Girls Club. I can't think of a better organization for us to go in and use, and we need about 500 of us. And, and over the course of the weekend, you put that much manpower and we have some skilled people in our church who know how to direct those of us who are as, not as skilled in ways to really make an impact. So that kids who went to a boys and girls club on a Friday and they come back on a Monday, they go, who, who did this? Who cares us about us like this? And in that tangible way to be able to say, Jesus cares about you. Because his church showed up. And so I, I'd encourage everybody, you don't wanna miss out. There, there's four different time slots you can serve on Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon or Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, but sign up for one of them so that we can go and make that difference together. And you don't wanna miss out on it. I, I promise you, we're gonna be showing a video of that and you'll go, oh man, I wish I'd been a part. And let us together share the gospel in this tangible way. I want to encourage you, maybe you're visiting with us, maybe you're jumping back in. We've been in a sermon series in the book of Romans, and even if you've missed all of it so far, we've covered five chapters, this is the perfect Sunday to start, especially coming off Easter. And so I'd encourage you, get your Bibles. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, pull it out on your phone or use one of the blue ones in front of you, but everybody, you're going to need a Bible in front of you. And part of the reason we do this is, one, you need to be verifying that when I'm preaching up here and I say the Bible says this, it actually says that. So you need to actually look at it and check on me. But it also, as you're reading through it, it there, there's a phenomenon that happens. If you'll actually see the words and you're reading through it, it helps you start understanding passages that might be difficult to understand. It helps it retain because you're reading through it. And so if you, don't, if you didn't bring one, grab one of the blue ones, it's page 1,120. If you did bring one, go ahead and get yours out, but, but all of us need to have the text in front of us. As we look at this new section of Romans, and the reason I say it's a perfect passage post-Easter, is last week we celebrated the life change that comes through Easter. We celebrated the, the historic uh, difference that the resurrection makes. And we invited people that you can have the opportunity to have a relationship with God through Christ because of what Christ did, any person can become a Christian. You literally can be justified. You can be declared righteous by his grace. It was what he did for us and we receive it through faith. Now for five chapters of Romans, Paul's been explaining to all of us why all of us need to do that. He's been explaining for five chapters why everybody on the planet needs to be justified, declared righteous by grace through faith. And, and so then the question comes, if you're a Christian, and maybe last weekend was your first step that you go, yeah, I became a Christian. Well, now that I'm a Christian, well, now what? In fact, sometimes as church, we're so guilty on man, we just want people to become Christians. And if they become a Christian, we high five them and we go, man, that is so awesome. Glad you're in the club. And we're done with it. Paul says, oh, oh no, when I'm explaining the gospel, we're just getting started. If you've been declared righteous, if you've become a Christian, 
Well, let's talk about what is that next part of the gospel, your salvation actually looks like. You know, I've, I've found when, when someone's a Christian, it's kind of like you're on this road and there's two ditches that people fall in. Somebody becomes a Christian and one ditch is that sometimes as Christians, sometimes different churches, we come along and we go, okay, you're a Christian, great. You got saved by grace, but we're gonna fix you now with a bunch of rules. And as soon as you become a Christian, you're told all the things you can do, can't do, and it's a bunch of rules from there on out. And so you were saved by grace, but I'm gonna work you to death. <laughs> and frankly, it's one of the reasons a lot of people don't wanna become Christians, because they see that and they go, whoa, I don't want that. It's a, a rule-based Christianity, a law-based Christianity. And Paul's gonna address that ditch. Well, in fact, we'll look at it next week. He'll go, yeah, you, you don't wanna live in that ditch. That's not what Christ called you to. Th there's a ditch on the other side though, and this is the group that they love the concept of grace, which we all do, that by grace, man, God gives me what I don't deserve. But grace becomes this golden ticket from now on. It's almost like I'm in the club, I'm a Christian now, and it doesn't really matter what I do, right or wrong, because Jesus forgives all of it. So I don't get too worried about it. Now, it's based on some truth. The rule-based side is based on some truth, but it's this wrong perspective. You know, D.A. Carson is a, a professor at Trinity Seminary, and he writes about, there was a, a period of his time where he was working on his German and he would meet with this young uh, African student who was in Chicago. And this young man was uh, from French West Africa. And so they both knew French together. They'd have a meal in French and then they'd work on their German. The young man was uh, in an engineering program that required him to know German. And Carson was working on his as well. And, and as they met, he got to know the man. He found out that the, the man, you know, brilliant, obviously. His wife was brilliant. She was in London studying to be a doctor. They were separated during this time. And he found out that several times during the week, the young man would leave the dinner and go to the red light district and visit a prostitute. Didn't think anything of it. Finally, one day Carson asked him, he said, what would you do if you found out your wife was doing the same thing in London? Without batting eye, he said, I'd kill her. He said, no, I'd literally kill her. And Carson said, isn't that a double standard? And he goes, no, where we're from in Africa, you need to understand culturally, the men can have as many relationships as they want. But if a woman crosses that line, she's killed. And, and Carson said, I, I, I know that culturally, didn't you grow up in a missionary school? Didn't you grow up in a Christian environment? And here's what the young man said to it. He said, uh, he, he said it in French, but then he said, ah, yes, but God is good. He's bound to forgive us. That's his job. Now you hear what he's saying? He, he's kind of espousing this ditch, that God's good and he's gonna forgive. That's just what God does. It's grace, man. You just need to, Embrace grace more. Now hear me, I'm all about grace. The apostle Paul is the chief proponent of teaching grace. But, but when he describes this, he says, can you live under grace in a way that it just gives us a free pass, a golden ticket to do whatever you want? Well, look with me in Romans chapter six, verse one. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So he asked this question, are we to just sin as much as we want? Because grace is gonna cover it. He's describing that perspective exactly. And, and you're gonna see this. Let me just give you a clue here from this point on in Romans six through chapter 11. Paul will do this every so often where he throws out these questions. And he, he's like a good lawyer. He's laid out his case in the first five chapters. And now he knows every question people have against his case. And so he's gonna th start throwing out these questions and then answering the question. 
And so he's not asking this question because Paul really thinks this. He knows this is a question that people have, that if you're saved by grace, doesn't that just open up the door that you could just do whatever you want once you're a Christian? Look at his response to that. He says, verse two, by no means. And that little line, we'll see it um, in, in uh, some translations. It's God forbid. It's may it never be by no means. For me, I, I just say it's, it's come on, man. Uh, you know, Monday night football, they always have a little segment. They show somebody do something really stupid. And then the announcer always looks at it. And he says, come on, man. That's Paul's response here. You ask this question, he looks at it, he goes, are you kidding me? Come on, man, you don't really think that, do you? And, and, and he's laying out in this that, that you can't live this way. Here's what he's trying to point out to us. And just, we need to realize as Christians, ignoring or underestimating sin is not an option for a Christian. It's just not an option. And so, so thinking that you can just kind of embrace it and just live in it, he goes, come on, man. And, and the reality, what you're gonna see in this, it, it's not whether you can, because you could look at it and you go, but you told me Jesus forgives everything. You told me grace covers all, it absolutely does. So Paul's not arguing about whether you can. His question is, why would you want to? Why, why would you even want to think that way? And, and so to turn it then, he goes, hey, let me give you the process for actually dealing with sin in your life because you're gonna have to deal with it. It's part of every Christian's life. In fact, we're gonna see next week in the next chapter, there's real struggles with it. He's not diminishing that. But, but he's gonna lay out in this chapter a process for dealing with sin in my life. And you're gonna see in this process, when I use that term process, it's not behavior modification, it's not sin management. It's not like he's gonna give you five things and if you can kind of clean up your life a little bit and be a good boy and be a good girl and don't do those really bad sins that everybody looks down on, but it's okay to have these few things in your life. That's not what he's teaching here. He goes, we, we need to deal with this in a radical way this process. And as we look to it, the first thing you're gonna see in the first 10 verses we'll see here, I have to know my new reality in Christ. The, 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 your, the verb that's used in the first 10 verses over and over again is know. You need to know, you need to know, you need to know. And I'll go ahead and lay out for you the two points he's gonna make in these 10 verses. You need to know that in Christ, I die to sin forever. And you need to know that in Christ, I live for God forever. And, and there's a part of this that's a mystery in it that you go, how did that happen? How did I die to sin? How did I? it happen when Christ died? What we celebrated last weekend, Christ's death on the cross and Christ's resurrection, that I'm actually in him. I was a part of that. And, and so for 10 verses before he tells us anything to do, by the way, he says, let's step back and make sure, do you know this? Do you know this is true about you? So read with me and let's work through these 10 verses as he's going to just lay out these two points over and over again. In Christ, I died to sin. In Christ, I live forever. Read with me in verse two. He says, by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And, and notice that word died. He didn't say we are dying to sin. He didn't say this is something you need to do. You need to die to sin. He, he uses the aorist tense. It's a past tense. And so he's describing us and he's describing, if you're a Christian, he says, how can we, who, who died? Not something you still have to do, not something you're still doing. You died to it when Christ died to it. Continues on with it. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So he's describing baptism here. Now, he's not just describing your physical baptism, water baptism with that. Um, when, when you're baptized into someone, that term baptismo means you're placed into union with them. You're placed under their authority. You're placed into their sphere. Uh, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, it described the children of Israel. They said they were baptized into the leadership of Moses, that they were under his authority, his spear. 
And, and so in the same way, if you're a Christian, the moment you became a Christian, you were baptized into Christ. There's a spiritual baptism that happens. And, and in that moment, spiritually, you died with Christ when he was on the cross and you rose with Christ. Now, physical baptism, water baptism, is the picture of what has happened. It's the symbol. It's not the agent that made it happen, but it's the symbol of what has happened. And so when somebody gets baptized, we baptize right over here. It's a great picture of exactly this principle that we take that person and they go down into the water. And, and we'll say in that, buried with Christ in baptism, because we're showing everybody what's happened in their life. Man, you were buried with Jesus. You went into the grave just like Jesus did. And, and then we pull them up out of the water, raised to walk in new life. Man, you've been raised just like Jesus did. Now again, let, let me be clear. It's not the water that accomplishes that. That's the symbol of what Christ did, not the agent. But it is an important picture. That's why Jesus commands every follower of Jesus, if you become a Christian, you're to be baptized. You're to show the world that. I, I always like in this, it's like my wedding ring. Um, this ring is a symbol that on December 22nd, 1990, I gave my life away. I gave my life to my wife and I won't give it to anybody else. Now, the ring didn't accomplish the wedding. It didn't accomplish that marriage. That was a covenant before God, but it's the symbol that I take from now on. And so you, you don't have to have a wedding ring to be married. You don't have to wear a wedding ring to be married. I'd encourage you to though because you're showing what has happened. And so I just say this at this moment, if, if you're a Christian and you've never been baptized, then you need to get baptized. That's why Jesus commanded it. It's your way of showing the world what has spiritually happened in your life. And so we do that as an act of obedience to him. So the first thing Paul's pointing out, is, he said, man, why would you wanna to live to sin when you died just like Jesus died and you rose with Jesus in that? He continues on, look at verse five. He says, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we're gonna live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives to God, he lives, he lives to God. And, and so this, this comparison to us, and, and you see it over and over again, that you've got to have this mindset that I died and now I live. And, and in that I died in the same way that Christ did. I lived the same way Christ did. And his death and life have been applied to me. So, so notice for 10 verses here, it's almost a recap of everything we've been doing in the first five chapters where Paul says, I want you to know this. Do you know this is true? Do you know this reality? Have you embraced not only his death, but you've also embraced his life. And, and you get credit for what only God could do. It's like if you were taking a test of life and you go to take the test and there's a hundred questions on the test and you're kind of going through the questions and you realize, you know, I'm getting some of these. I'm doing pretty good on some of these and some of these I know I'm missing. And the whole time you're taking the test, what are you thinking? You're thinking, well, I wonder how many you have to get in order to pass this test of life. And you go to turn your test in and you ask the teacher, you say, what's a passing grade? And the teacher looks at you and says, oh, you have to get 100 out of 100 to pass. You have to get a perfect score to pass? Yeah, that's the standard. And you go, who can do that? And they go, oh, one student did. Here, here's his test. Jesus, oh, thanks. Great. Now, here's the great news about the gospel. At that moment, Jesus comes over and says, hey, you didn't do so well. In fact, you didn't do as well as you thought you did. But come here, I want you to come take my test and I want you to sign your name at the top of it. 
And you're looking around and you're like, am I allowed to do this? He says, oh yeah, you're allowed. And you write your name at the top and the teacher takes the test and goes, well, congratulations, you made 100, you passed. You get credit for all that he did. No matter how lousy you did in it. Because th this is the good news. This is the gospel. This is the amazing part about grace. I don't want to diminish grace one bit out of it. That's the amazing part. And Paul says, I want to make sure, do you know this is true about you? Because some of you keep living like you're still taking the test. And you're not quite there. And you haven't measured up. And you go, but Tim, I've got real sin issues in my life. We'll deal with that. You have to know this first. And then as you know this, look at the second part of it. With knowing then, I have to embrace my new reality in Christ. Look at verse 11. Read with me in it. Verse 11, he says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That, that word consider, uh, old translations have it as reckon. You must reckon, you must consider. And even then the English doesn't do it justice. Because you know, like in the South, we would use the word reckon. I reckon I'm gonna go on down to the store. It's kind of like a little decision. Or you're considering, you know, consider almost like I'm considering, do I want vanilla ice cream or chocolate, chocolate chip? This word in the Greek, it's a very formal word. It's, it's like crossing the Rubicon. It, it's this word of when you consider, it's a reckoning about you, about your life. In fact, for those of you who take notes in your Bible, you can note here, this is the first command in the whole book of Romans. You realize we've gone five and a half chapters. Paul has not written one command to us yet. There's not one thing that he's told us you need to do. You need to do this, you need to do that. Because for five and a half chapters, he needs to make sure that we know what Christ has done. Guys, this is the difference in Christianity, by the way. Other religions, right out of the gate, you know what they point to you? What you need to do. You need to keep this rule, and you need to keep this day, and you need to do this, and you need to make sure with karma or whatever it is, you look at every other system, they always start with what you have to accomplish and what you have to do to be worthy. Paul says, no, 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 let me make sure you're real clear. You have to know what only Christ could do, and what Christ did, and what Christ did for you. And so the first command in the whole book is that you need to consider, you need to embrace that what he did is your reality. That it's actually true for you. And out of that consideration then, then you move, I have to decide daily to live in that new reality. See, if I don't know that reality, I'll go out and I'll do a bunch of sin management. I'll do things to try to get right with God. That's not the gospel. If I don't know that reality, I can't live in that reality. So I have to know it. And then I have to make a formal decision in my life. That is my reality. I, I'm not going to define myself the way my own thoughts define myself. I'm not going to define myself how other people have defined me. I'm not going to define myself what the world says about me. My reality is based on Christ alone. And then I'm going to live every day in that reality. And he says, in that choice, you got to do two things. You're going to have to say no to the old master, which is sin. And then I got to present myself daily to the new master, Christ. Read with me as he describes this. Look how he puts it in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought to death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no more dominion over you since you're not under law, you're under the grace. You're under grace in this. And, and so he describes it in this way, this new reality is sin is the old master. It was like you were a slave on the plantation. You were bound in slavery and sin was the master. Sin controlled you, sin was over you. 
And, and Paul says, that's not your reality anymore. You've been set free. And so now Christ is my master. And, and in that, I have to make a daily choice. And notice he says, present your members, present your body. Um, he's going to tell us how to do that in real practical ways, starting in Romans chapter 12. In fact, a lot of us have been through Romans 12 and how to be a living sacrifice. That's that practical part of the book where he's gonna tell us how to live this out. But here, here's why I think it's so important. You gotta have the theology first. Because we can just jump there and go, man, I'm gonna go try to live like that. And Paul says, yeah, but let's base it on actually what God's done. And so Romans chapter six gives us the ability to understand how Romans 12 can be a reality in our life. And with that, you have to know what Christ has done. I have to consider and make that choice. And then every day, I've got this decision. Do I live according to my old master or do I live according to my new master? And, and to do that, do I, do I say no to that old master? I died to sin. Remember he said your old self died, but sin didn't die. He still likes being in control. And, and so all of that, now I know when I say sin, he's personifying it in a way. He's talking about everything that would fall under sin whether it's Satan, whether it's the world system, whether, whether it's the flesh that gets tempted with that, he says all of that wants to woo you, wants to control you, but you've got to make that break that I present myself. Notice he says my members. He's talking about your body. He's talking about your gifts. He's talking about your mind. When, when Jesus says you serve the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, he, he's talking about all of who I am, that every day I've got this choice. Am I gonna use who I was made to be to serve an old master? Or, or today, will I look at it and go, man, how did Jesus make me? How did Jesus wire me? How did Jesus gift me? How did Jesus put me on this planet with what purpose? And am I using this today and presenting to him all of who I am so I can experience that life? And again, we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like because the rest of the book, Paul's gonna unpack for us, man, the kind of life that you can have. But I'll tell you, so many people, they get stopped right at this decision point. And part of it is a mindset they, that they kind of convince themselves, well, I've been saved, but I'm still a lousy Christian. Oh, I'm still such a sinner. In fact, that's all they focus on. And, and you can kind of get caught in this trap. Maybe you feel this way. You ever, you ever felt like, I know God loves me. I know Jesus loves me, but I don't know why. And if I could just get my act together, I'd be one of those good children of God. But I don't seem to be able to do that. Now, again, sin's a real struggle. Next chapter, Paul's going to tell us real honestly about that struggle. But, but, but there's this breaking point in the mentality here that if we don't realize the freedom we've been set free to, we act like we're still slaves. It was interesting, I was reading, you know, the last nation, the nation of Mauritania, it's an African nation, was the last country on the planet that outlawed slavery, 1981. And it wasn't until 2007 that they had laws where they could prosecute slave owners. And even then it was hard for people to leave slavery. Uh, in the New Yorker, Alexis Akiowo wrote a, a story and just was documenting the, the slaves that were struggling with it. it report on the situation, no one in the one community who looks like them has ever known a different way of life. One former child slave told me in the village, when a slave says he does not want to be a slave anymore, People will ask, why? Who are you? Who do you think you are that you're not a slave? Your mother was a slave. Your grandmother was a slave. Just who do you think you are? To the slave, his identity is his master. And the master becomes an idol. One he can never become and in his mind, the master becomes invincible. And, and, and I'll, I'll look at that picture because it's the same, it's the exact same thing that Satan does to us. That we have this freedom in Christ that I am not a slave to sin. Man, his first voice of accusation is, uh, who do you think you are? You're not so good. 
I mean, look what you just thought. Look what you did. He points out all the reasons you need to consider yourself. Maybe I've been freed in Christ, but I'm gonna live like a slave. And this power of sin, it's really invincible in my life. There's really no overcoming it. I I know I've told you before, but the, the movie for me that pictures this so well is the Shawshank Redemption. That's one of my favorites. And let me just go ahead and warn you, <laughs> if you watch it, it's set in a prison, there's rough language and mature themes. It's usually on TV about every other day. So you might watch that version. But, but this, the story of Tim Robbins is Andy Dufresne, this, this banker who's falsely in prison with false accusations back in 1947 in Shawshank Prison. And he becomes best friends with Ellis Boyd Redding, Red, uh, who's played by Morgan Freeman. And as you watch that friendship and you watch these men in prison and what prison does to you. In fact, one, one of the nicest characters in the whole, whole movie is this older guy named Brooks. And one day Brooks goes a little crazy and they can't figure out why until they find out he's been paroled. It's been there over 50 years. He's this gentle character who keeps the prison library. But once he's set free from the prison, in one of the saddest scenes in the movie, you see that Brooks can't make it on the outside. Ultimately takes his life. And and as the prisoners are sitting there reading about it, and they can't fathom it. One of them said, well, Brooks just bugged out. In other words, he went crazy. And Morgan Freeman, as read, says, no, no. You need to realize he was institutionalized. He said, what, what, what do you mean? He said, you've been in this prison for 50 years and you hate these walls at first, but you get used to these walls and you get used to this life and you can't fathom life outside of it. He was institutionalized because it was too scary to live free. I I look at that scene and the sadness of it and, and I think for a lot of Christians who've even experienced all that Paul described, we've been justified by Jesus. We're no longer slaves, but this concept of really embracing who we are and the freedom we have. It's easy to live an institutionalized Christianity where you may declare freedom, but in your mind, sin's still the master. It's still the one in charge. That's why Paul's spending this whole chapter to go, before I ever tell you how to live this out, before we ever get to the practical part, I think part of the problem is we are often prone to jump to practical parts and we never really deal with the theological part. If you don't deal with the theological part, you don't know you're really free. And he says, some of you need to have a reckoning. You need to consider yourself, I'm not under that master anymore. I'm not a slave. And when that voice comes and says, who are you to think that? You go, you're exactly right. I'm not, but Christ let me put my name on his test and I get his name and I get his credit and I get what he did. And the last I checked, he not only died on the cross, he rose again and I get that too. And if he lives in freedom, I live in freedom. See, we have to embrace this. In fact, if you back up a little bit more, maybe you're sitting here and you go, well, I'm not even a Christian. The the reality is, even if you're not a Christian, no matter who you are, all of us are either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. There's no middle ground, by the way. Look how he puts it in verse 15. He says, what then, are we to sin because we're not under law and grace? By no means. Do you not know that you're to present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves? You're a slave to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. 
And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms. He said, I'm using this analogy in a human term. For just as you were once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. He, he said, this, this is a reality for every single person. You were either a slave to sin or a slave to Christ. See, we like to picture ourselves, and everybody on the planet does, that I'm kind of a free moral agent. I'm right here in the middle. And I'll decide if I'm doing good things or bad things. But it's my decision in that. And Paul says, I, I hate to break to you, it's just like he said in chapter five, you're either under the kingdom of Adam or the kingdom of Christ. And now he uses it in this way, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to Christ. He's in absolute control of your life. But there's no middle ground. And, and for every single person, this is true. Uh, I'm, I'm a big Bob Dylan fan. And, and uh, I, his 1979 album, Slow Train Coming, I think it's one of the best ever. Remember the, the key song off of it? Serve somebody. Yeah, you don't remember it, not many Dylan fans here. <laughs> It actually won the Grammy for best rock song that year. It's a Christian album. And in it, he goes through, it doesn't matter if you're an ambassador, doesn't matter if you're a president, doesn't matter if you're a construction worker. He goes to everybody on the planet and then he goes to that chorus. It doesn't matter who you are. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna serve somebody. Serve somebody. <laughs> and then, serve somebody. And then the voice in he said, it's true of every single person. John Lennon hated the song so much, he wrote a counter song, Serve Yourself. Because he didn't like anybody telling him, you're gonna serve somebody. You hear what Lennon's saying? Lennon's saying, I'm a free moral agent. I decide what I'm gonna do. Uh, Dylan actually is, is teaching Romans 6 when he says, I hate to break it to you, you're not so free. And, and you're either serving one or the other. And, and look where they both lead. Let's finish out the chapter with it. When you do that, for when you were slaves to sin, you were free regard to righteousness, but what fruit were you getting at the time of the things which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit, what leads to your life, leads to sanctification in its in eternal life. And then he summarizes the whole thing, verse 23. It's one of the most famous verses in it. It's a summary of all of it. For the wages of sin, what you earn from sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's one or the other. And so for every person on the planet, if you're obeying sin, it always leads to the death of what you love. That's what death is. Everything that's good, everything you love, everything you ever hope for in life, the wages of sin. You know what obeying sin does? It just leads to a slow death coming. It's the death of relationships. It leads to the death of your perspective the death of your soul, the death of the things you hope to be. And, and the hard part is sin is so attractive in ways, but it's this attraction that kills every time. You know, back in, in 1987, this great picture of this in Brazil had one of the, the most widespread radiological disasters. And it started so simple. It was a medical clinic that had been abandoned. And, and unfortunately they left one piece of machinery that was used to treat cancer that had radioactive dust in it. And some guys came and they robbed the building. They found this piece and, and they went and they punctured a hole in it. And when they looked at it, this blue light came out because it was a radioactive material. They sold it to a scrapyard owner and he thought it was supernatural. And so he would invite all of his neighbors over and they'd all stare at the blue light. In fact, they finally broke it open and they found the dust in it, the blue dust that glowed in the dark. 
They, they thought it had healing power. Four people were killed. 112,000 people had to be treated. It, it was so attractive. And it was killing them. That's, that's what Paul says sin does. The wages of it, what you earn from it, what it always leads to is death. And, and then he flips it though and, and tells us in Christ, and here's the great news, obeying Christ always leads to the life you always wanted. It always leads there. Now it doesn't feel that way. It can feel counterintuitive at times. In fact, you can kind of hear that and you go, yeah, but if I really obey Christ in every area, it feels restricting. Here's the principle behind it. And, and just stop for a minute and think. If we really believe God is good, and if you really believe God designed life, wouldn't a good designer of life lead us into experiencing it more? So even in those places where he's saying things to me that are hard, and you read through the Bible, I mean, God talks about your money, talks about your sex life, talks about how you treat people talks about how you use power. I mean, he hits all the things that at times you come up against it and you go, this doesn't feel freeing unless I remember, wait a second, he's good. He's actually the designer of life. And Jesus promised, I came that you'd have abundant life. And he didn't just mean when you die someday, he actually meant right now. But that means I've got to trust him enough that instead of listening to that old master that I'm used to, instead of being attracted to sin, which actually is killing me, every day I would make a choice and go, okay, Christ, you get all of me. I'm presenting all of who I am to you. And so if your word says it, okay, I'm gonna do it. Because I believe you want me to experience life. See, Paul paints this picture of hope of what life can be. And it actually can be experienced here. But you got to believe. You know, in the movie Shawshank, there reaches a point that Andy, who's been framed unjustly, realizes he's going to die there if he doesn't do something about it. And he's talking to Red one day and he says, oh man, I would go down to the Pacific coast of Mexico the ocean's as blue as you've ever seen. He says, you ever get out of here, you ought to come down there one day too. And Red warns him, he says, hope is a dangerous thing in prison. And Andy looks at him and says, no, hope is the best of things. He says, Red, you, you gotta decide, you gotta get busy living or get busy dying. And Red looks up one day, he gets paroled just like Brooks. He finds himself outside the prison and just like Brooks, he's scared to death because he's been institutionalized. He doesn't know if he can make it out here. The difference for Red though is Andy gave him hope. In fact, he sets it up in a way that he gives Red means some money. And then at the end of the movie, you see this test. Red, are you going to trust him enough to believe there could be a better life? And, and you see that last scene when Red, unlike Brooks, who said, I, I just can't fathom life out here. Red said, I have a dream of what life could be out here. And he gets on a bus. And you see that last scene on the Pacific coast of Mexico with the blue ocean as there is red walking and he sees his friend Andy and he recognizes there's a new life that's about to begin because there was hope that it could be different. Guys, that's what Paul's painting for us. He says, you, you, you don't have to be scared to leave the life you knew. You don't have to create a bunch of rules just to leave that life. 
You don't have to pretend like sin doesn't matter because it does matter. You don't like it in your life. See, what Paul's been writing in this whole chapter is you got to decide, do you want to get busy living (laughs) or do you want to get busy dying? And, And it comes down to a choice. Will I embrace the new reality of what Christ has done? And will I decide by faith, radical faith, every day, yeah, I'm not a slave to that anymore. In fact, my new master actually designed life. And so every day he gets all of me. Because everything he calls me to do is life abundantly. Is that reality true for you? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the radical things that Christ did for us. That we not only experience that salvation of being declared righteous, but but we get to live in it. We get to live in that freedom. And even today, as I say it, it, it's easier to preach it than to live it. To really embrace this. This is true for me. I am free. I don't have to obey that old master. Lord, I I pray for each of us here today. I I pray maybe there's somebody here, they they look at their life in reality, they've been a little institutionalized. They've convinced themselves that they'll never leave sin behind. They've convinced themselves that maybe it's a habit, maybe it's a fear, maybe it's something they've held on to. Lord, I pray today they'd have a reckoning. They'd consider themselves dead to that and alive to Christ. Lord, I pray as we go from this day, it's one thing to preach it here. It's another thing tomorrow morning when we wake up. I pray we would instantly think tomorrow morning that we're dead. We're dead to sin. We're alive to Christ. And every day we would make a presentation of all of who we are to the master who loves us most. And we pray this in his name. Amen.